Hi there, everyone. It's Tim's Vinyl Confessions. Tim Durling with John the Music Nut once again. And it's YNT Deep Dive. We are continuing with our, our, our Deep Dive series. And we're still in the 90s for the second of YNT's two mid-90s releases, Endangered Species from 1997. And uh, so what uh, John's got there is something that uh, the band made available on their website called Incorrect Species, which was musically incorrect, an endangered species in one package, which is good because the, the two individual CDs kind of uh, went out of print. And uh, there's also some bonus uh, video footage on there, isn't there, John? On the second disc, there is there's, yeah. there's some bonus video footage you have to put in your computer in order to play it. Yes. Yeah. Yes, but here's the um, here's the CD for yeah. endangered species. Yes, yeah. So. yeah, it's a good package. I initially got mm -hmm. this this CD um, as soon as I found it. It was available in I think I ended up getting this in early '98, and this is a UK CD on Music for Nations Records. Okay. And, yes. And, um, yeah, the CD itself kind of cool, personalized, and um, and I think these are reprinted inside the the CD that John's got there, but. Not only does this not have all the, the lyrics, but unlike Musically Incorrect, this has a little bit of credits and it's actually got um, some ramblings from Phil Kenimore on each of the songs, Correct. Which, which is really interesting. And another thing that's really interesting is that I think this is the only time that I can think of um, where, depending on where you got the, the album, the track listing was a little bit different. Because uh, this is a this is a cassette that was put out in North America by D Rock Records, which is a company that flared up in the late '90s. They uh, they did a lot of tribute albums, and uh, they also put a, a like Helix Half Alive Rat Collage. There were a few releases right. like that, and they and they put out Endangered Species, and the songs are in different order on here than they are on my my UK CD. So, um, yeah, it doesn't happen very often, but. So anyway, this is, um, John, I think this would be safe to say that this is a more, you know, musically incorrect was definitely, you could tell it was Y&T, but that they were adjusting to the new decade. Well, not adjusting to the new decade, but they were adjusting to being back and right. making music in the current climate. This sounds like it could have followed up, you know, contagious or like this this sounds like a yt album through and through i would say Did you say they were a little bit more maybe uh focused on making a yt sounding album this time or at times yeah because sometimes it sounds like they're going more into the direction that they started with with musically incorrect they're actually getting heavier on a lot of these songs and sometimes and, and closer to grunge at times um and then you have some songs that are very reminiscent of where they would go with on 10. And then of course you got two songs that are got a real jazz groove in them. Yeah. Which I, which I, I would all, was always curious if they stayed active, like if they made an album in 99 or 2000, right. let's say, would they continue to go down that route? Because you had like, you had three different things going on here. The, the jazz thing, the heavy thing, and songs that sounded very contagious, ten era. Yeah, yeah, and and but those songs where they're in a more traditional sound, uh, they're a good deal brighter than than musically incorrect. And musically incorrect was great. Agree. Musically incorrect was great. That's not a it's not a slight on it. I like the fact that album to album, you know, we each album seems to have its own character. So right. let's get started with. Um, well, first of all, I think the title is kind of cool because just like Musically Incorrect was a comment on the times, you know, Endangered Species kind of is too. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is that the, this was a fan voted title. Uh, according to talking to Jeff Keir, who I talked to extensively in my Y&T book, yes. um, this was a fan voted title, which is kind of cool. The, uh, the front covers always kind of reminded me a little bit of David Lee Roth's Eat and Smile. <laughs> oh yeah just just a little bit so okay. let's talk about the let's talk about the tracks in the album uh, and i'm going to go by my cd because that's the one i got first and that's what i'm used to hearing so if i'm if i'm different from yours we'll 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 mention that i think all versions have hello hello i'm back again as the first track it wouldn't really make sense to 
open with anything else. What do you think about this one? Okay, like just like musically incorrect, they start with something slow, grindy, and mid tempo. They don't they don't go into a longer direction like they did on Long Way Down, where it turns into a long jam. This is more direct, more compact, um, very heavy. Um, it's a it's a very good opener. Um and it's it's good. Hello, hello, I'm back again. You know, pretty just, self-explanatory. Yep, yep, I'm yeah. back again after we had the hiatus. We came back long way down from uh musically incorrect, and then two years later, I'm back again. So yeah, it's it's a good opener. I wouldn't say it's one of their best openers, but it's good. Dave's singing, still singing well. He's a little deeper on here. Then I think he is on musically incorrect, and that's throughout yeah. the album. Yeah, you know it could be close to three years in between recordings. You know, okay, we, we're not sure about that, but uh, um, next song is Black Gold. This one is really really interesting. Um, Phil explains what this song is about in the the liner notes. What what is your take on this song? Okay, this follows that same pattern as Hello Hello with the men with that menacing delivery. Great riff on here. Yeah, this riff riff is killer. It's heavy, but then after the solo, the first solo, they pick up the tempo big time, and then it goes into this long jam, a la dazed and confused, which Tim you wrote about in your book, because um, that was the first thing I thought when I first heard this. But this is killer. If you want to hear the great musicianship of this band, it's here for you again. Jimmy DeGrasso plays like a monster on this. Um, excellent track. And then they go right back into the main theme. So, like, the songs on here are tighter than they are on Musically Incorrect. But this is a killer second track. Yeah. And it's unusual for Y&T because, unless, well, except for, like, saying Rock We Trust, they didn't get told that much. This song was about the O.J. Simpson trial, which was, I mean, that dominated the news in, in the mm -hmm. mid-90s and, and right. uh, for that. Um, kind of, you know, and I, I mentioned in the book, I mean, now could be seen as controversial, but it kind of came and went without without much fuss. Um, right. Next up, now, okay, so on my CD, the next track is God Only Knows. Yes. Which is... Um, which is the first of a couple of ballads on here. What do you think of this? This is not a Beach Boys cover, by the way. <laughs> no, it's not. This is very reflective. Um, strong track here. Nice bridge after the solo, which is very good. Um, but again, it's, you know, we stay in that mid-tempo vein. Here, Dave sings very well. I, he still sounds really strong on the ballads. No question about that. But... This is, if you like these reflective ballads that YMT does, here's another great one. Um, it works well in that third spot on the album, too. Like the third spot, like think of like Temptation from Contagious. Something slower, more reflective works really well in that third spot. And they did it here on God Only Knows. Yeah, it's really great. Dave does sing really great. And it, yeah, it's got, you know, do, 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 do. like it's got those melody lines. Mm -hmm. Um They've never, they, they just, they, they haven't lost a step with any of it, but like the ballads, you can, you can always count on them to come through with the ballads. And then uh, they come through with one of the heaviest riffs, I think, that they've ever come up with. Ironically, this riff was written by Jimmy DeGrasso. This is one of the, let's tune yeah. it down and let's, let's do drop D. Something for nothing. Something for number four, nothing. Kind right. of slot, it's like a glam rock spelling. I don't know why they did that, but what do you think of this song? Oh, this is as this is probably as close to grunge as a song that they ever did. Yeah. Um, very menacing and heavy. This is it's if you only know them for the 80s albums, this is gonna take take you off guard. But it's very well done. It shows the musicality of this band that they can pull off different styles and do them really well and add to their musical palette, not sound completely out of place like a lot of bands were trying to do during this time there's a few i can name off the top of my head but when they went into a darker deeper direction y and t did it very well they still sounded like themselves 
So yeah, I dig this track. Yeah, it's you can still tell it's YNT, you can still tell it's Dave. Um, yeah, and and by the way, it's also it's the same lineup on this album. Mm -hmm. So it's still the you know Steph Burns, Jimmy DeGrasso lineup. Um, next up, can't stop the rain. How about this one? Wicked. Yeah. You know, I'm more heavy. This is heavy yeah. too, but this is faster. Yeah. This this will knock your Aunt Connie socks off. This song, it's just the delivery on here. Fantastic I mean, fantastic riff, like just fantastic, great. fantastic riff. Great musicianship on here. They're throwing in all these little things that really differentiate them from other bands, like like this. Um, killer again. This is not your YNT from the late seventies or any time in the eighties, or even your YNT from the Ten album. This is sick, heavy menacing but strong it's a good song it's a memorable song memorable yeah. riff excellent yeah and i like how it switches back and forth between that sort of um not herky jerky but it's like like it yep. switches back and forth in in tempo yeah really great playing on here um and jimmy degrasso further proving like why wasn't he on most of ten? Um, you know, he's yeah, proving his exactly. here. And again, like like musically incorrect, it's well produced. It's the same production team. It's Scott Bore, Dave, Phil, and Jimmy. And I think that was the same as produced musically incorrect. It's good sounding. It's good, clear sounding material. Um, next, we get another ballad, "Sail on By." How about this one? I love this song, and I think it brings me to my issue with the album: the sequencing. This should be the closer. This plays like an album closer. Yeah. It's another one of those. I mean, I like this more than God only knows. But when yeah. you listen to this, you're thinking, why isn't this in the this time or winds of change or yeah. hands of time position? Yeah. This should I... be the closer of the album. It's that great reflective ballad, power ballad that Y and T do better than any other band. Dave again sounds strong when he when he can sing a ballad like nobody. And I know I'm repeating myself, but yeah. excellent song. And yeah. you know, this does take you back to their 80s days, but you know, we don't got any keyboards there. We just got the acoustic guitars and we got that build up into the soaring chorus. That's yeah. Y and Z. Great. Um, it's great. Yeah, yeah, really good parts in this. And and I like the fact that they did this um on the uh the one live night CD DVD that they put out in 2007. There's, I don't, I don't think they did it in the, in the show, but there's, there's sound, they sound check it, which is kind of neat that they lean. Right. This. this is a very traditional sounding uh, Y&T ballad. And I never thought of it before, but you're right. This should have closed the album. Yes. I mean, it just seems out of place after you have five songs and four really heavy. It just sounds yeah. like an out. It sounds like an outlier, unless you know their catalog. You know their yeah. catalog. First thing you're, why is this here? I mean, even if it was the, I don't even know if it. And we're in the CD age. We're not buying vinyl at this point. We're buying very few cassettes. Yeah, so, yeah. And the funny thing is, is it doesn't even occupy the side one closing position on the cassette. Oh, okay. which is now it, now. The, the vinyl, which came out many years later on Night of the Vinyl Dead, uh, technically it follows the CD track listing, um, but it's on two different records. But it does close the first record. Okay. So I think it was always meant to close side one, but yeah, they should have saved it for, for side two, but you know, they, they, they do, they, they were following their own muse at this point, but it would have, maybe that's why they didn't. I don't know. Um, on the other hand, we'll get there, but there is another slow song that's close to the end spot. So who knows? Um, right. So next up, we've got Still Falling. What are your thoughts on this one? Starts out slow, and then it goes into this wicked riff. This is driving, yet dramatic at the same time. Yeah. This is a killer track. The choruses work so well. There's the pre-chorus that goes into the chorus is very strong. There are times it's really reflective. Oh, it's a, it starts out very reflective before it builds into that riff, and that riff is a wicked riff. 
this is killer. Um, yeah. this would have fit in on the '80s albums, maybe the maybe more like a contagious. I think yeah. this would have fit in, but yeah, another strong track here. It's maybe, kind of like forever in this or position. Midnight in Tokyo, so it probably should have closed side one, and it does close side one of the cassette. We'll get it after right. we finish. This, I'll go over the cassette track listing out about mm-hmm. this song. Phil says undeniable similarities to our earlier stuff. Soft. Slow intro into high energy rhythm, blazing grips with lots of melody and intensity, a bit of the classic YT chord arrangements. Uh, on the surface, it's a love song, but I refer to it, I relate it more to my feelings about playing music. So, uh, yes, the, the one, the act, the, I, I love the fact that Phil's got the rem, the, uh, well, not the reminiscences, the line, the liner notes in real time on, on what he thought of each of these songs. Right. Um, next up is, one of the more interesting songs on here, I Want to Cry. I love it. Yeah. I this shows you the great rhythm section that's Phil and Jimmy. They drive this. Dave, as I allude to in the book, Dave sounds really sensual on this with yeah. his vocals. This is killer. And then they go into that riff, which is like a it it the the riff has a groove to it too, and it's very memorable. And it kind of goes quiet and then it goes loud again. But I would have loved if they went more into this direction. It, even on Face Melter, I would have loved if they went more into this direction. And I do listen to songs like this and another one we're going to talk about soon. And like, oh, I wish they made an album in 2000, 2001, where they have continued this. It's different. But if you know the musicianship of this band... It makes sense. It is a killer track. Killer. Dave throws himself into whatever the vocal is. He'll yes. like, I'm sure he'll like get the lyrics from Phil and go, okay. Yep. Like, I know. It's almost like a character. Yeah, you sing and for the song. This yep. this song, um, I would say something for nothing, maybe can't stop the rain. They almost sound like they might have been written for musically incorrect, or they might have been written around that time. But um but yeah, the, the fusion y like Dave was listening to a lot of fusion stuff at the time. And mm-hmm. yeah, it makes you wonder because yeah, the, the the next things that would come out would be the two, like Dave's solo album on the blue side and then and then the Menachetti album, which were, you know, which essentially he had a, a self-named band there for a while. But there were Y and T um members on both to a certain degree, and and they didn't sound that different because you've got Dave on vocals and then right. but yeah, it was it would be 13 more years before, you know. The, the next studio album so it does make you wonder if there's other tracks sitting around that that followed that because i love that direction it was um they were not denying who they were as a band and what their trademark sound was they were exploring and were. It's, and and the fact that so few people have heard these albums you know what i mean they didn't have the major label push they just it's like these are for these are for a very select group of people who get it and 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 I was one of them. I was just I was just I was open to hear what they were, what they were going to do. Me too. Um, yeah, it, it really good. Next up, I think a little bit more traditional Y and T song. Give me the beat. This is cool. It's like a lot of their songs. It's it starts out slow, but it builds into that great chorus. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So this is good. Um, just a spoiler alert here. I've been looking at some set list on set list FM. They've brought they brought this back. This sounds like a live. Album. This sounds like a good live track. Yeah, when I saw that, I'm like, okay, that's a good one right there. Yeah. But you know, this is more in the spirit of traditional Y and T with the slow burn into the chorus and very melodic and mem- memorable chorus. Um, excellent song. Yeah. Very good. A lot of uh, there's a lot of like rhythmic imagery in the lyrics too. Mm-hmm. Like it, it really Crazy. plays in, but without sounding over the top. But yeah, it's got that great sort of like circular riff. Um, but um, it's got great drumming and it's got, it, it slows that. down to the chorus, then it kicks back. Oh, the dynamics. Mm-hmm. The dynamics are just fully, fully at work here. Next yes. up, really, really unusual track, Voices. What, do you what think a groove. One? Yeah. Oh, what a groove on this. And not just with your rhythm section, but 
Jimmy and Steph here. I'm yeah. sorry, Dave and Steph here. Yeah. Um, with the get guitar, those guitar lines are excellent. I love the harmonies during the choruses. Um, excellent stuff. Um, little different, but as Tim alluded to, the great thing about this band is they didn't just give the fans what they want. Oh, let's go back to the old sound so much. They were building on these albums from the 90s. Starting with 10, they were building a little bit, but you really heard it. I'm musically incorrect and endangered species. This is a really cool track. A cool griff on here. And again, the groove is awesome. This this also sounds like it could have fit on musically incorrect. It's got yes. that off filter. Lot, you know, Jim Jimmy's using lots of toms and it, yeah, it, it's a really, really, um, I would think it'd be a really hard track to get down, like rehearse and uh, like it would, it would be a cool sounding track live. But if like, if you got off by like one half beat, you'd be, it'd be a train wreck. Mm -hmm. I um, agree with that. Yes. And the last vocal track on here is the third ballad, Try to Believe. Now this, I think, should have ended side one. Yeah, or been the so. sixth track. Yeah, um, mid tempo, contemplative. You got that's Phil on those vocals originally, and then Dave's coming in. You can hear Phil still on the harmonies too. Very yeah, high. yeah, yes. So very personal, um, more melancholy than their yeah. other ballads. Um, it, it it's very good. It's not a showstopper ballad like they're so well known for, but yeah. it's a nice change of pace on here. It's a good, it's a good track, but again, I would place that here. Oh, and we were talking about "Give Me the Beat" before. I was writing in my notes. I would have flip flopped them and something for nothing too, because I think you got too much heavy early. Yeah. And what I would have done is mixed it up, put "Give Me the Beat" at the four, the four spot, and then at the nine spot or side two, song three. If you have, um, we'll. If you had a cassette back then, actually, well, you said the cassette has a different running order, but yeah, if the cassette was like this order. I would have, and it's a, and it's a weird track listing too. Yeah, <laughs> and interestingly, and I know I mentioned this in the book, the track listing on this version of the CD is different than what you hear on the CD. Oh. Um, yes, we we can get into that after we talk about it yeah i mean just for example give me the beat is listed third god only knows is listed fourth um they do have tried to believe right but they have can't stop the rain at 10th and that's number five i mean they're all over the place except for the first two tracks i have a feeling and the last two oh, I, have still a feeling, I have a feeling i know what they did but i'm not sure all um right. But the um, now, what's interesting is the the last track called Rocco, um, which I believe was named after. Um, these are so small, Rocco, or what we did on our lunch break. A very spontaneous tune that came out of listening to a fusion song, Dave in Dave's living room as we went or on our lunch break from the studio. Uh, this was a beat that Dave, uh, let's see, no, where does it say that? Okay, so it's somebody's dog, because in the thank yous, it says Rocco for continuously growling at Jimmy. Good boy. <laughs> <laughs> this is another, this is an instrumental for the first time since uh, uh, I'll Cry For You on Contagious and really not too many instrumentals. This is an, an instrumental that closes the album. What do you think of this track? Well, I love fusion, so I'm all over this. And again, I, I think this should have been track 11 before Sail on By. I think this would yeah. have been a great gateway into that. Again, this is spectacular. And I like this. I Like, I want to cry as that same feel. Um, but this is definitely more jazzy, more fusion. Dave, holy smokes, is he... He plays well all the time, but on here you're like, it's like jaw dropping stuff. Yeah, and oh, he's sort gosh. of like uh, scatting. 
Yes, he is. Like, so it's, it's really, you know, you know what it might have been cool? You mentioned I want to cry. It would have been cool if I want to cry had, like, vamped out and gone into this. That would have been nice, too. Like, uh, you know, let's, like Def Leppard did with bringing on the heartbreak into Switch 625. Mm-hmm. They could have easily done that and just made it two separate tracks, but they didn't. But um, It'd be so, nice if they did that live, too. Can you imagine oh, if you did yeah. that live? <laughs> it would be like yeah. this, like, oh, my God, I can't believe they're doing this. And, and it's funny because, you know, Y&T is a band that, by their nature, you go to see y and you're a diehard music fan. You know, you it, it's a never an impulse. Let's go see y and got to know who they are. you got to know what they play. But with these two albums, I still feel like these two albums are like a treasure for the few, just because they just weren't that widely distributed. And for them to go into anything from these albums, it's like... I remember seeing a, a back in... I think back in 96, I remember seeing a Kiss cover band. And they tea like the the guy that was playing Paul Stanley teased the crap out of us. He started playing the riff to the oath. And like most people are not paying any attention. Me and the buddies I was with were losing our mind. Play it, play it all, play it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it would kind of would have been like that. And you know, exactly. um, the footage that uh, you know, but I don't know when this, you know, whenever this airs, people probably will have seen the footage from the the cruise that that YNT played at. First of all, Dave sounds fantastic. Like they sounded so good, they did long way down. Mm-hmm. Yes, I could did. not believe. I think, like, what a cool surprise! And uh, so, yeah, when the, you you could throw any of these songs into a set list, and people would be like, "Wow, I wasn't expecting that." And you know, it's and it's good stuff. So that's the album. Now I'm going to get into the track listing on the cassette. Which, by the way, the, both okay. of these albums, musically incorrect and endangered species, I never, ever, ever saw a cassette back when they were current i i, I, I would probably would have bought them i definitely would have bought them i didn't know the, these were ebay purchases for me okay um, so i think what I, what we're going to find is the track listing on this cassette is the track listing that they have listed oh, okay. on the track of the cd there you go it's hello hello i'm back again right. black gold give me the beat god only knows something for nothing still falling am i with you so far yeah Yep. Voices. I want to cry. Sail on by. Can't stop the rain. Try to believe and rock out. Yep. That's exactly what they did. Exactly. I, yeah. Kind of reminds me of like Van Halen did this a couple of times. They'd have the songs on the back listed in alphabetical order. It's like, who cares if it's in alphabetical <laughs> order? I want to know what order the, I don't want to know what tracks three, four. Yeah. So, um, exactly. and it's interesting about Rocco is that only on the CD is it called a bonus track. On the cassette right. and the vinyl, it's just listed. As just huh. a song. Yep. I don't get it. But and again, um, we were talking about what musically incorrect. We were talking about the sound. They were going for different producers on every album. This and they this is musically incorrect. It was them and Scott Borey. Yep. That was yeah. that's the sound. They found it when they were releasing albums independently. And Dave had built his studio and he had already produced other artists, so they knew what they were doing, and they came up with great sounds for both of them. So, absolutely, um, yeah. The the th- the thing when you the back to the Rocco bonus track thing, when you see that, that implies that there's a version that doesn't have that song. Yeah, you would think. unless the the North American de Rock CD doesn't have it. Maybe that's it. But anyway. Um, so there you go. That's 1997's musically incorrect. We're um we're working our way through the YT catalog. A uh, great response so far. So thanks everybody that keeps watching. And I hope we can turn some people onto these latter day albums that that might have thought they stopped with ten. Um, because it's if you can find them, it's it's still great YT music. It's there's nothing lesser about it. The fact that they were on smaller labels or independent labels. It's just it's just good good material seasoned with those years of experience and uh, again a dynamite lineup playing them and just to let y'all know as we're filming this you can still get this at yntrocks.com yep. 16 dollars us yeah great two way he's a killer, mu- killer music great way to get those two cds i mean you still might want to find them separately but it's a great way to get them so there you go 
So, John, thank you very much for sitting in once thank again. You, the deep dive has been an absolute pleasure. And thanks, everyone, for watching this edition of Tim's Vinyl Confessions.